Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Parlay Revival. On last week's episode, we did a grueling three-day race upwind against SV Delos, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. If you want to see who ended up winning, our hurricane damaged catamaran or their 53-foot Amal Monahal. It was one hell of a race. This week, we start to explore the Tuamotu Islands and swim with hundreds of sharks in Fakarava South Pass. So I'm Colin, and this is the crew of Pale Revival. From hurricane damaged, to broken bulkheads, and getting struck by lightning not once but twice, to being the strongest and fastest Lagoon 450 on the planet. We are now sailing 5,000 miles from Mexico to New Zealand, my home, before continuing our circumnavigation. So subscribe to follow our journey around this beautiful planet. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things you did. So what are you waiting for? So our race with Delos ended in Raroia and was our first ever atoll that we had entered with Parlay. It was super nerve-wracking entering the pass, but luckily we were able to follow Brian in the whole way to the anchorage. The Tuamotu Islands are made up of 76 atolls, which are actually old volcanoes where the center has subsided, forming a ring of coral on the outside with a lagoon in the middle. This process can take up to 30 million years for an atoll to form, but for sailors, it creates a beautifully protected anchorage on the inside. But to get into an atoll, you have to go in through a cut in the reef called a pass. But the currents can be as high as 10 knots here as the water tries to escape the lagoon with the dropping tide. Once inside, there are loads of coral heads called bommies scattered all over the place. So they can be extremely difficult to navigate through even once you've conquered the pass. We had been looking forward to the Tuamotu Islands for years, as this is many cruisers' favorite place on earth. But even in paradise, there are always boat jobs to do. Okay, so we're sailing here. Well, actually, the first one fell out uh, across the Pacific and completely forgot about it. And then I was on watch, and then from the heavens, this random bolt fell down. I literally can't think of where it's from. And then Jamie went up this morning, and he couldn't see where it's from. So I'm going to go have a look. See if I can figure it out, but it's never a good thing when you got bolts falling out of your mast from an unknown location. So I'm gonna go up there and have a look. One other thing, our radar stopped working. It's killing us. Well, not really, we did fine without it, but it's nice to have. It's trying to boot up, it says initializing, and then it's saying it's failed. Spoke to Rain Marine, they say there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. It's internally fried. It could be because the radar was inside, it was actually sitting there when we got struck by lightning that second time. So just the amount of electricity in the boat um, could have messed something up that was quite fragile inside there. It's very common for electronics to fail down the line once they've been um, exposed to lightning. So that could be one explanation. But kind of need to find out where these go. So I'll take you guys up, you can enjoy the view up there with me. It looks pretty freaking spectacular. All right, I've already found where they're from. They're just from one of the cars here. Two of these. I'm assuming because this just fits perfectly into the head there. It's fallen from the top of the mast twice. Mystery sound. You. We're still gonna go up to the top and replace the, the base for the antenna, the VHF. Um, it, there's a plastic one up there and it's all, it's all shitty looking so I'm going to go with a stainless steel one that I got. Woo! That's it, that's it! See this plastic one here? It's just so wobbly, look at that. It's going to break for sure. Oh, it's already starting to crack. So, look at it. I want to get rid of that, swap it out. Don't drop anything. Seriously hurt someone if I drop this bracket here. One. Two. Going down. Okay, job well done, but now Joe's is gonna go up. First time I assume. 
first time. He's going up to make sure he did a good job. <laughs> don't, don't check that antenna. This way? It's yeah. a bit of a joke. It's not going to do anything if you fall out of it. That's it. So while we had the bosun's chair out, we sent Chosen up the mast. Parley's mast is 76 foot high, so not for the faint-hearted. Yeah, the view? It's great. <laughs> Not on a mass, but it worked 33 floors up one time. I think there's a lot of firsts for Stephen on this trip, the chosen one. We call him the chosen one because he was selected to come across the Pacific with us and he's still with us. So, first time up in mast, I remember that feeling. You going up? No, man. Why not? No. I don't think so. I'm going to get you up there one day. Okay. Okay, the boys are working and the girls are going. So while the boys did some more boat jobs, the girls went to explore some of the sea life in the area. First day of spring, and I just want to sing to everything that's moving, every single little thing. To them birds flying free, fish in the sea. Amazing. Oh my god, I don't know what else to say. Were you scared? I wasn't until somebody yelled short. <laughs> and then everybody swam to it. So I made sure to stay with the group. <laughs> Can we be in a more spectacular, beautiful place? This is unreal. As most of you guys know, one of our favourite things to do is cook a meal over a hot fire on the beach. We actually happened to have quite a few friends in the Anchorage who we had met over the years. The route that people usually sail across the South Pacific is often referred to as the milk run, which is the easiest and most logical way to transit the Pacific Ocean. People usually leave from Mexico or Panama and end up in the Marquesas Islands. They then sail downwind through the Tuamotu Islands towards Tahiti. From there they hop over to Tonga or Samoa, then they end up in New Zealand, Australia or Fiji. This also has to be done outside of the cyclone season, so what ends up happening is that you constantly bump into fellow cruisers doing the same journey at the same time. This means that at every anchorage you go to, you always see familiar faces, and the community aspect of sailing becomes one of the best parts about this lifestyle. We are exploring the most beautiful places in the world with like-minded people all trying to live their lives to the fullest and that is what makes this such an amazing experience. Gonna fuck a rava. Uh, we've got crew flying out. So we've got to keep moving unfortunately. These are ideal conditions. This is what we uh, this is what we want. The sun's behind us. Um, downwind sailing through the pass. Do you feel confident doing this without Brian leading the way? Yeah, I feel more confident doing this now than under the conditions that we did it in coming in. That was sketchy <laughs> to say the least. I only did it because I saw Brian do it. I would never have done it like that. But that's why he's the uh, expert. And it's been fun hanging out with Brian and Kaz. They're such amazing, humble, down-to-earth people. You know, these are, the, these are the people that I used to watch five, six, seven years ago. They inspired me to start this YouTube channel that's, that you guys are watching now. So, you know, forever grateful for what they've done and what, what they do. And uh, they continue to inspire millions of people. If you had told me six years ago when I bought the boat that I would be doing a one-on-one -on -one friendly race with Dallas, I would have said you absolutely crazy. I don't have time for that, but now we're actually hanging out with them and it's very humbling. 
Gotta pinch myself sometimes. I like to think in some way we can we can pass that on. Maybe we're inspiring some of you guys to go out and follow your dreams. And the cycle continues because they've um, helped me have the courage to pursue my dreams. So yeah, it's all just very, very sweet. I'm going up the mast for the first time to look for some bombies. <laughs> As this was the first atoll I'd ever sailed through, and I didn't have Brian leading the way, Katie volunteered to be on lookout from up the mast to help me spot any reefs along the way. You get a great vantage point from up there, and on top of the rain marine charts I was watching our position on Google Earth on the iPad, so we had all of our bases covered. I'll see if Katie's paying attention, I'll head straight towards one of these reefs and see if she yells out. Ready? <laughs> cool, she's paying attention. I went straight for that bottle there. Okay, we're coming out of the pass soon. Got Katie still up there, but just at the first breader. We've just come off low tide, so actually ideal conditions. We've got a little bit of water coming into the atoll, so that's going to give me good steerage. And uh, we've got a track already laid. Everything's super ideal right now. The, wind, the sun's behind us. Feeling really comfortable about this. Not like it was coming in. Always sketchy catching a drone in 20 knots. Okay, let's go out this pass. The reason we can't keep flying for you guys is because there's an airport right there and it won't let us fly. The only thing sketchier than going through these passes is almost flying a drone through these passes right by an airport zone. What happens is the drone just can't come any further forward. If we were out the pass and that happened, we'd have to turn around and come back in the pass to get the drone. Not ideal. How do we look, Katie? We've got the um, tide coming into the atoll okay. and the wind going out. Right. So it's creating those little bits of chop there. But you can see it's really shallow on the right yeah. and on the left. Okay, we did it. Good job, KD. We're out of the pass. We are in 700 feet of water. The atoll's right there. Just drops off. Oh my god, it was so fun. I loved it. <laughs> 189 miles. So it's 7.40 and we want to time it so we get there about 5 o'clock. Not ideal, but it's quite a narrow pass with a lot of current. And uh, we sail there, Warren and Erica. They've been super helpful. They've been out here for a year. underway. <laughs> you know what, it's got its quirks. <laughs> it's kind of the same, but it's a little bit topsy-turvy. Like every time you open this, if I can demonstrate, you just gotta kind of go like this the whole time. <laughs> so we just talked up again. I think it's a big mahi. Doing eight knots. It's taking a while to get this one in. Something just happened. I don't know, Shark might have got it. It's still flying. There you go. Got a long way to go. Oh, a sailfish. Oh. No way! It's my first sailfish! Yeah, it's no like Bilba. Okay. Oh. Yeah, you're, you're right. Lady of life, madam. He's gone. It was there and then it was gone like, completely. I thought we lost it. Dragon's breath lure. This guy just made these for us and gave them to us. And the Blackfin Rod sponsored gear is delivering. Okay, we've just identified it as a short billed spearfish. Because it didn't have a big bill on it. That's definitely what it was. Beautiful fish. So he had still a lot of life left in him. So we released him. He's going to live to tell another tale. Good job. Okay, we're coming up to Whakarawa South Pass. It's quite sketchy, we've got all the wind and the waves and everything going straight into the entrance here. So, got to be a little bit careful. There's a monohull coming out now and he's getting thrown all over the place. Britt's got the drone up. Got everyone spotting for reefs and stuff. This is only our second pass entrance ever, so still taking it very cautiously. We've got Google Earth here, we've got the chart plotter and Navionics. 
and the drone. Just one hour before slack tide, with the tide coming up to high. Everyone's got polarized sunglasses on. So, ticking all the boxes. I'll start the other engine. It's getting rolly. Woo. Surfing into the pass. You may be wondering what all the fuss is about coming in and out of these passes. And in fact, even when I look at this drone footage, it seems like there is a ton of space around us. But trust me when I say that they are a lot more challenging than they look. A drone shot makes everything look so clear, but in reality, when you are at the helm, it feels like you are literally surrounded by coral reefs. On top of that, there's a current either working against you or pushing you faster into the path, so controlling the boat is much harder than it looks. Trade winds are also usually blowing at around 20 knots, which cause so much windage on a big cat like Parlay. One thing's for sure though, it is moments like this that I'm so grateful to have two engines, because disaster can happen at any moment if a monohull loses their engine. I think this is our friends, they're waving here. That's We Sail, our friends. We've been bumping into them all over the place as well, but we first met them in Guatemala, and then in Panama, and they were in Mexico, so we're super excited to hang out with them. A lot in common with those guys. They're a YouTube channel as well if you want to go check them out. I've been to a lot of places. I've been working at sea or on boats since I was 22, and this might be the bluest water I've ever seen. Unbelievable. Warren was kind enough to handle our mooring lines for us as the mooring ball itself was actually slightly submerged, making it not only hard to find, but almost impossible to tie to from the boat. Moorings like this help reduce the number of anchors destroying the reef, and these ones were even free, which is pretty uncommon around the world these days. Five star welcome service provided by We Sail. So we were safely moored in crystal clear waters of Fakarava, the second largest of all atolls in the Tuamotu Islands. Look at these colors. This has to be one of the most beautiful places we've ever been. This is what we're talking about right here. Good to have we sell here. Bit of local knowledge, I guess. Chosen just wants to go to the bar right here. It's been a while since we've been in a bar. The only bars we've been to are sand bars. Sand bars and muesli bars. <laughs> been our lunch. You can literally see the bottom somehow. It's the bluest water I've ever seen. The water here is insane. It is so clear and blue and it's actually, it's actually, I checked on the depth sound, it's 30 feet here and you can see the bottom. Cheers guys! Cheers! Cheers. To the bar. Warren! Hey buddy. Good, Good to see you, you again, man. Well done, bud. Well done. Hi. Hi. Nice oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so cool. Amazing. Right when we pulled in, there was like black tip sharks. Yeah. Cheers! Cheers, big boat. Mmm. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. This place is insane. The water is, it's the clearest water I've ever seen in my life. We're gonna go for a dive or a free dive in here tomorrow. Far out, we've landed in paradise. This, this is what we were thinking when we were thinking Tuamotis. This crystal clear water, white sandy beach, it's super nice locals. It's like we're just having a beer at someone's house, like that's how welcoming they are. Unbelievable. It's so nice to be here. Okay, so this morning we're going to go for a dive, scuba dive. Um, Warren, who's a very, very, very experienced diver, and he's been in the area for uh, about a year. He's going to take us to uh, dive in the pass here, which has got tons of sharks and some really cool, like, overhangs and stuff that you can go under. So it's a fairly, like, an intermediate to advanced dive. A lot of current. High tide is at 1, 1.30, so it'll be the tides coming in. So all of that beautiful, clear, deep sea water is coming in through that pass. Dive day. Yay. So exciting. This one's in the bar and the other one's in the PSI. So I gave the girls a little refresher so that we would be ready for what is known by many as one of the most impressive dives in the world. It has been named the Wall of Sharks and people fly from all over the globe to witness the spectacle. But some of the crew were a little more excited than others. I've never really done like a shark dive before so 
only with like nurse sharks in Bahamas. <laughs> so I'm excited. I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited. And I think this is my favorite dive wherever we've been so far. Like the reason why we came back here this year, I think, is mostly for this dive. So we all descended to around 70 feet, where we were immediately greeted by resident reef sharks. The beauty of timing the dive for when we did, is that we were able to get dropped off at the entrance of the pass and let the current take us all the way into the atoll and get picked up at the other side. In the pass were mostly black tip and grey reef sharks, and some of them had huge scars all over them. We later found out that only a few days earlier, a group of divers had witnessed the great hammerhead eat one of the reef sharks right in front of their eyes. This could possibly explain the teeth marks on a few of the lucky survivors. Sharks are hugely misunderstood, largely because of the Jaws movies, which I myself remember having nightmares over for months afterwards. Some of you may be watching thinking that this is absolute madness. But in reality, the chances of one of these guys turning around and biting you is pretty much unheard of. But the sheer numbers is what makes this dive so remarkable. And it was truly a sight to behold. We were having an absolute blast down there, and it was one of those dives which we wish would never end. As this is a marine reserve, the grouper and other fish were carelessly swimming around, and thriving in numbers as they are free to live unaffected by fishermen. All in all, this went down as the single most amazing dive I had ever done, and we were only just starting to explore the Tuamotu Islands. I can't wait to show you guys what this place has to offer, so make sure you subscribe and I'll see you next Sunday.